Hi, folks. Having a good day, and let me first welcome you to Autism Rocks and Rolls. Now, before we begin, I must know that I'm not a psychiatrist. If you're starting to be diagnosed with autism, please see a physician. I'll be based on my experiences. I also know the right to the intro natural. They're found on ytmp3.com. I also have missed this interview with all of you. The mission of Autism Rocks and Rolls is to take the stigma off of autism and other conditions that may think are disabilities. People on the spectrum are not broken and do not need to be fixed. Those that conditions or at least want to be pitied, there's nothing to be sorry about. It also has some paid for the following. Casals Financial Consulting Incorporated is a must look. Pamela Cotton works for Casals Consulting as a financial consultant. Among the services, she assists clients with their, with their funding, life insurance, home protection, objectives, annuities, 401ks, IRAs, healthcare, pre perpetual income, and pension optimization. She will collaborate with you to make sure everything related to your finances is in order. And she will also make sure that it is, that it is good to go. Reach Ms. Cotman at casalsfc at gmail.com or the main office. And there are also people I'd like to thank. I have to thank my grandfather, who sadly passed away on December 1st, 2023. He was born in 1937. From that day he was born, Gary Mitchell did things his way. We, we paid tribute to him at a funeral held at the Ferguson Lee Chapel of Thorn George Family Funeral Homes. Everyone did honor him. Thank you to all that came. An extra thanks goes to ARAR sponsor Dave White for the dinner after. Rest in peace, Big Air. You will be missed. So today we have from across the country, England's own Megan Prescott. Megan is an actor, writer, and director who started. Try that again. Today we have from across the country, England's own Megan Prescott. Megan is an actor, writer, and director who stars Katie Fitch from the BAFTA Award winning British drama Skins. Since her time on Skins, Megan has turned her focus more into writing and directing. Last summer, Megan did some directing work from the Bernie Grills, which is now streaming on Paramount+. Plus. She is currently recording the first season on her podcast, Really Good Exposure, which will be released in the new year. What you may not know about her, what you may not know about her is that in December 2021, she was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, and before that, she was diagnosed with ADHD. However, did not stop her from taking part in bodybuilding. Let's welcome the strong in-and-out actress and bodybuilder, Megan Prescott, to Autism Rocks and Rolls. Megan, what's up? Hello, thank you for having me. Not a problem. So my first question to you is, what does having autism mean to you? <clears throat> I think having autism means I see the world differently from what a neuro from how a neurotypical person would see the world, and I digest the world differently to how a neurotypical person would. But since getting my diagnosis, it's helped me kind of break it down and realize that just because I see things a different way and process things differently, it's not bad. And sometimes it, it's actually a benefit. So it means that I'm different to your average neurotypical person, but it doesn't necessarily mean that's not a good thing. No, I agree with you. You're hundred percent right. And let's think about history. Didn't good change didn't good change world? Didn't different change the world? Yeah, exactly. So look at Albert Einstein, look at Bill Gates. Yeah. The, you know, the, I feel like there was a lot of people who did amazing things in the past who were most likely on the spectrum, but a lot of them maybe were undiagnosed because it wasn't as talked about or understood. Um but yeah, I think without people that think outside the box, nothing would ever change. So, Oh, you're 100% right there. Now, what were your initial thoughts when you learned that you had autism? Um, I think, so there was like, I guess, two different versions of when I thought I had autism. So there was when I actually started thinking, oh, actually, I think I might. And then there was when I actually got diagnosed officially. And there was probably like, two years between those two things um I don't know if how it is in the U.S. but in the U.K. we have the National Health Service which is free um but it doesn't receive the funding it should from the government so things like um ADHD and autism are very very difficult to get a diagnosis through the NHS for because they just don't have the funding for the or the um the knowledge of it um so I had to go privately and I had to save up to get a diagnosis because it's very, very expensive. Um, but when I started learning about autism, 
it kind of coincided with my ADHD diagnosis. Um, and at first I was like, oh no, that's not me. I don't, I don't relate to, um, to, to having autism. And I read a couple of books about women with autism and there, it was weird because I really related to some of the things, but because they weren't exactly the same, my brain was like, oh no, it's not the same. So I don't have autism. So I don't know if you've heard the trope of young boys uh, getting diagnosed with autism because they're, they have a fixation on trains or, or planes or something typically that little boys are interested in. Um, and girls often get missed when they're talking about diagnoses because a lot of the research was done on young boys. And so just because what we are hyper-focused on or we're very interested in might differ from what a lot of the research says, it doesn't mean that we still have the, the seed in us to get hyper-fixated on things. Um, so it was, it, was, it was a lot of like unlearning. And I think genuinely the most helpful tool was Instagram um, and following pages about autistic women or autism in general or late diagnosis autism. And then I was like, oh, I, I highly relate to almost all of this. This would explain a lot in my life. Maybe I should pursue a diagnosis. Um, so I was kind of in the interim for about two years. And then when I finally got an actual diagnosis, it was like the, the biggest relief and validation to have somebody actually say all those things that you think you struggle with and that that you see differently, there's a reason and you're right, that is the reason and it was just the most validating thing that's ever happened to me in my life. It was amazing. Well, I'll be honest with you. At first, when I was doing the research, I didn't think you were until I watched, until I saw how outspoken you were. Yeah. You're one of the most outspoken people I think I've ever met. I'm not going to lie to you. Yeah. So, yeah, I got in trouble a lot when I was younger as well. And like I got expelled from school and. There was a lot of stuff. And then I started reading about the justice, justice sensitivity is that. And I was like, oh, right. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I ain't complaining. I love it. You got, yeah. you got someone else who was very outspoken too. And is not afraid to say what's on his mind. I do a lot of uh, speaking before thinking. Same. <laughs> but what was looking back on it, what were some of your fixations? I was when um let me think specific fixations well uh, if I look at my career like if we look at bodybuilding bodybuilding was a fixation it's something that's that you that I got absolutely obsessed with and it is a very dramatic thing to do if you're not if you've never been in that world and that wasn't your life and you're but I got hyper fixated on it um, there are a lot of things that I get hyper fixated on and I'm like months or years later, I'm like, why did I spend so much of my time and money on this thing? Bodybuilding is not one of those. I'm very happy that I did it. Um, but I think, I think in my youth, I had Lego. I was absolutely obsessed with Lego, um, building little worlds for my characters and making, making voices for them. Um, there must've been a million hyper fixations. I can't think of uh, any now, but other uh, signs that I think a lot of people around me missed when I was younger that I was autistic was such an extreme uh, sensitivity to clothing and having my hair brushed and like my hair got matted and because I could not deal with the feeling of having my hair brushed and certain shoes I had to wear I could only wear one type of shoe and they would I would wear them till they were falling apart because otherwise I would just I would have a meltdown with I now have the language to understand that it was it was a meltdown. But obviously at the time they just thought this is an unbearable child. Um, and yeah, clothing was, and sensitivity of clothing was a very big thing for me when I was younger. Mine too, except mine's with you get, don't you dare pour water on it. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. don't you dare pour water on my clothes. That is the one thing I'm like, I'm running for the hills for that. Really? 
do you have this thing where I have the, a thing about water where I hate one part of my body being wet and not the rest so like if 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 you're having a bath I hate that like it's or if you're washing your face only your face you'll wash it I don't I don't know how to explain it it's like water I'm just like oh god no like if I could avoid showering altogether I would <laughs> no I get it I can Luckily, shower pretty I... much every part of my body but don't but unless it's nighttime I'm not share, showering my hair because for some yeah, reason, that, yes. I don't Wet know what hair. you're doing, but the hair, it stays damp during the day. I can't deal with wet hair. That's a thing. Like, and so I have I grew it long specifically so that every day I have it in a plait like this, like a friend, like a braid. Because otherwise the feeling of wet hair on me, I can't, mm, I can't deal with it. Oh, I, I feel you there, buddy. I feel you there. Maybe we just lot. need an event shower. Well, these there is shower caps. Yeah, shower caps. Like I sleep in a I sleep in a bonnet because it's better. It doesn't damage your hair, but it still keeps it out of the way. So I feel you on that one. They just don't have any for men. Like, where are the shower caps for men? Yeah, or you can use a regular shower cap. Yeah, I've done that before. <laughs> now, how do you think our brain specifically operate? You said differently, but. I guess I'm asking how differently do we think more black and white? I know we do, but just give more examples, please. I look at things incredibly black and white to the point that I didn't even recognize how black and white I look at things until I got my diagnosis and started like breaking down how I think. Um, and it takes a long time after diagnosis to be like, oh, wow, that this goes deep. This runs deep. <laughs> um Black and white thinking is very difficult. I, when I was younger, I had a very hard time keeping friends or making friends because such little things to me, if someone did one thing, I would be like, right, well, they're not a good friend. And I can't be friends with someone that doesn't understand. The Even like they took too long to text back one time. Like I would cut people off because I couldn't understand. I was like, no, if, if, it, it was so black and white to me and then luckily over the years and with therapy I've I've kind of trained myself to learn no people ebb and flow and they have their own stuff going on so you can't just think of relationships as black and white as you used to but obviously it's still a big struggle and it takes work every day to remind myself of that especially with my neurotypical friends because obviously they don't understand that something could mean so much to me that they wouldn't think twice about um I think I think I often look at um this might sound like a bad analogy but I often look at younger kids and I'm like ah they're doing what I feel like doing but society has made me like hide all the things I want to do and not say the things I want to say. And that ends up with exhaustion and meltdowns and et cetera. But I did, I read this thing. Um, I think it was actually on Instagram and it was saying that there's a theory uh, as to how autism develops that has something to do with, I'm going to butcher this because I am not a science person, but it has something to do with neurological pathways when you're young and you have so many more when you're younger and they eventually get pruned. The The ones that aren't useful get pruned as you get older. So as you get older, you have less and less of these like uh, neural pathways. So I guess like nerves of some description. So when you're younger, you are much more sensitive to, to feeling of clothes, the the feeling of, sh the, of the shower water, you know, not wanting to do things you don't absolutely want to do. And then as you neurotypical folks get older, those unhelpful, like useless um, neurological neurons, whatever, I'm, I'm butchering this, but they get pruned. But the theory is that with autistic people, they don't ever get pruned. So we continue to feel just as sensitive to all the things that like babies and children are, but we just have to, to be socially acceptable. We, we're like forced to try and hide it. And obviously that's a luxury that not everybody has the ability to do. Like not everybody can, forced down how they really feel it's sometimes impossible and I thought that was a really interesting way to learn to look at it um in the way of just like I feel more of everything all the time 
and that's the best way I have kind of broken it down as to explain to neurotypical people how I feel and how I think. So in retrospect, we haven't grown up yet. Yeah, well, yeah. but then I look at, but then I, I used to be a nanny and I love kids. Like kids, I'm like, yeah, they're just, they're just saying what they think. This is great. Like they, I'm not, they're not doing all this weird social, like lies and weird tricks that we adults have to do in conversation. They're just telling me how they feel. And if they don't like it, they'll tell me they're bored. And like, maybe it will hurt my feelings quickly, but I'm like, well, at least I know that when they are happy, they're not faking it. They're genuinely having a good time. Um, and I tend to find that I get on with a lot of people who other people would be like, they are unbearable. I feel because that I'm, one. I feel uh, that yeah, one. I because, think I may shoot more people than pet people. Yeah. Because uh, of I, the I, autism. I'm not trying to make it pity party here. It's just the truth. I th It's hard, but it, it is like, I think when you understand how your own brain works and how, and I understand how sometimes I get it very wrong in social situations. So I give other people a lot more grace when I know that they're uh, neurodivergent. Cause I'm like, well, yeah, we all have different difficulties and I will cut them a lot more slack than I would, for example, a neurotypical person if, because I'm like, no, you are just not being nice because you're not being nice. But someone who's neurodivergent might not understand the social rules that we all are like forced to go by for some reason. Um, and I also feel like a lot of people that neurotypical people think are rude or blunt or like, un, 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 like difficult to work with. Like, I understand why they think that, but I'm like, or are they just very honest? And and they're not lying about how they, they're not pretending and doing this like facade, like they're just being who they are. And yeah, maybe sometimes it's like abrupt, but at least you know that they're not pretending to feel a way that they don't. And I would actually, I find, I find those people much more, much less exhausting to be around than neurotypical people sometimes who are always pretending. But I don't get it a lot. It's very exhausting. So basically, it sounds like everybody except those on the autism spectrum have imposter syndrome. I mean, maybe. Uh, maybe, I, that's I, what I I'm do, thinking. I think we're being ourselves, at least, because it's very difficult not to be. And, and when we are trying to hide who we really are, like I was for the uh, first 30 years of my life, you get burnt out and exhausted all the time and you're like oh I wonder what this is and all of a sudden when you get diagnosed you're like all right I'm trying to fit a mold and I have been trying to fit a mold for 30 years that wasn't built for me and I'm no longer trying to fit it and that's I think I have had less burnout and less meltdown since I got diagnosed because I'm not trying to force myself as much to fit that mold anymore all right I, I hear you there now what is the most rewarding and the most difficult thing about having autism? I think the most difficult thing is it 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 can get very lonely um, if you don't find your tribe. Like, luckily, I am finding my tribe and I have some amazing friends who understand how my brain works um, and give me the grace that friends give each other um but it is very hard because I can only really speak for myself I can't really speak for like all autistic people but I think I when I'm in social situations especially group situations I find it very hard to understand the dynamics and what each person's relationship is to each other and how we then need to interact outside of that social situation when we were in a group like whatsapp group chats I get very confused with like what the vibe is and neurotypical people I find often really can't understand why some neurodivergent people aren't great in loud social situations with a lot going on and with drinking and a lot of those situations happen at night so like a lot of socializing happens at night and I really if I don't get nine hours sleep I just can't function. I really can't function. And I have found it difficult to like make myself go to social social events, which are always in the evening because 
I want to see my friends and I don't want to feel lonely. I want to bond with friends, but I also find it, it messes up my sleep. It, I, I don't drink, so I, I can't like get involved in that kind of stuff. But yeah, it does sometimes feel like quite lonely because especially if you haven't found your like group of neurodivergent friends, which I luckily have, you just, if you, everyone would feel lonely if you think nobody understands you and nobody thinks the way you think and everyone thinks you're rude and abrupt and uh, it's, it can be, I I can imagine it can be incredibly lonely. And I've been through times when I'm like, wow, this is lonely. And especially when you don't know you're autistic, you don't know why you feel so lonely. And then even going to social situations, you feel lonely in them. So it, I do feel very, very bad for people that don't get the luxury of a diagnosis to help them understand why they might feel lonely. I hear you because even though it took probably about 15 years to find the tribe, Finding the tribe, while I'm glad I did, it was exhausting. It took a lot yeah. out of me. And it I personally think, from a personal perspective, why we have a hard time with social groups, and this is just my opinion, they change the topic so fast. One minute it's pepperoni yeah. pizza, next thing you know, we're talking about the balloons popping. Uh, yes. And then there's like music in the background. And then you have a thought. I think this is my ADHD, but I have a thought. And then I'm like, oh, my God. If I don't say this thought right now, I'm going to forget it. And then if I say it, I'm rude and I'm interrupting. And I know that. But if I hold it in, I'm trying to hold the thought, not forget the thought, but also concentrate on what they're saying to me. And I get home and I'm like, oh, my God, oh, I'm drained. And then I have this social battery that I really need to pay attention to. Because if it runs low and I push it, nothing good comes of that. Where were you my whole entire life? I mean, yeah. for real. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what advice would you give to someone who just learned they had autism? Um, I would say, again, this sounds kind of crap, but I would really say go on Instagram and follow accounts. Like there are specific accounts for like a, a lot of different types of uh, neurodivergence and the autism ones I found the most helpful ones were the ones for people with autism and ADHD because like there's a lot for both of those individually and then when I found the ones for people who have both I was like oh my god this is great because autism and ADHD they're quite contradictory to have at the same time so I think that's why a lot of the time I thought oh maybe I'm I can't be autistic because I like change I get bored with the same routine but but actually when I thought about it I was like actually that's only when I control the change if someone else controls the change I break down but it's very hard to explain how someone with ADHD and autism might present that because they are contradictory and finding Instagram pages that I could relate to about that I was like oh my god these are the words that I've never been able to find to explain how I feel and someone else is doing the exhausting work of saying them and creating infographics and I don't have and so instead of like trying to explain it to my neurotypical friends I can just send them an infographic and I'm like someone's explained it for me I don't need to do the exhausting work um so I would highly recommend following Instagram pages about autism um reading books about autism um I I just, I listen to books because I, I can't, I, I, because of the ADHD, I find it very hard to sit and read a physical book, but I love walking and listening to books. Um, so I've listened to countless books on autism and ADHD that way. And that really, it makes you feel supported, especially when it's like scientists saying, no, this is the new research. And we actually got it wrong all those years ago. And actually there's a lot of people, especially women who live undiagnosed because they present so differently and you just feel it's just validating. So I'd say social media and books really, really did help and trying to find a tribe, but that is, that is a, that is quite a tiring endeavor, but I would, if you have the energy, I would try and do it. I would also add podcasts because in the year 2023, oh, because there it's growing, 
And absolutely I'm because I run one. I'm just saying that in general, they're they're no. growing. It's kind of going to beat radio, I think, one day. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think when you find someone, that's why podcasts are great. When you find someone who you looked up to or you related to, and you find out they're autistic, it's just it it just does something to you when when I found out I was autistic I was like I don't know if I'm going to speak publicly about this because it feels very vulnerable especially because people just don't understand autism in women at all like it's so I feel like if I tell people I'm autistic it's giving them the free reign to think that I I do all these things or I'm to judge me in a way that I'm like but that's not that's not that's not who I am and I I have a thing about control and I like being able to control the narrative and it took for me to find like a partner who was so accepting and never he never treated me like I was strange or it, 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 he only ever treated my autism as if it was like part of what makes me me and part of what he really likes about me and then I felt comfortable to be like right well I need to say this publicly because there could be someone just like me who's like looking for someone who they see themselves in and they can't find anyone speaking publicly about having autism so they don't tell anyone either and then they feel even more lonely um but I there's a comedian um she's she's big and she's getting big in America as well her name's Fern Brady and um she's a Scottish comedian and I love her and I knew her well before I was diagnosed as autistic she got diagnosed with autism I think in like 2020 and was starting to talk about it publicly and genuinely if I hadn't known that she had autism and saw how she spoke about it and thought well I don't think of her any differently I still like her and I, I actually think this is more interesting like I'm fascinated about it if I hadn't known that she was autistic I, I don't know and and if I hadn't had my partner I don't know if I would have had been brave enough to like say it publicly because it just felt so vulnerable um but that's why I thought it was important to talk about it because she was talking about it and that made me feel more comfortable to do it are you are you still with your partner because I never I never know like when I did the digging I could not find my boyfriend or anything like that no no I'm still I'm still with my partner I just I don't post a lot about I don't really post about him on uh on Instagram because it's like I post about everything else on Instagram so I'm like let me just keep something maybe no I hear you yeah so you also were big hit on the skins series so out of all the skins scenes what was your favorite skin scene to film Okay, there was one that was the like the best at first, and then it quickly went into like the worst. Not the worst, but like not fun. So at first we had a so we had a scene when we were eating brownies in um this character Pandora's bedroom, and we were all having like a sleepover. And the idea was that these brownies had been spiked, and by by my character, and um I think was it my character. I think so, me or Effie. And uh, we were all eating these brownies in Pandora's bedroom and getting more and more high as we ate the brownies. And when I read it in the script, I was like, brownies are like my one of my favorite things to eat. And I was like, oh my God, this is going to be great. We're just going to be a day of eating brownies. Great. And then we had to do the scene. So it was, it was, that was my favorite scene at first. But when we had to do that scene, like, like 20 times and like eating that many brownies, it was to the point where we were all like, I will throw up if I eat any more brownies. And the who I think someone, one of the runners was coming around with like a bin bag off like after each cut. And we would just literally spit out chewed up brownie because nobody could swallow any more brownie because we've had so much. You you never think you'd be here anymore. I'm tired of eating brownies. I really was like, no, trust me, I'll be good. No, I'll be fine. There's no amount of brownies I can't eat. And then I was like, oh my God, no, no not another one. But it hasn't put me off brownies. I still, still one of my favorite things. Still do it. Well, now I want to talk to you about your character, Katie Finch, a little more. So are there any similarities to the character, Katie Finch, and yourself, the actor behind Katie Finch? Um, and differences. Are there any differences too? 
So I'm a lot nicer to my sister, I like to think, than <laughs> I think Katie is. Um, but it's weird. I feel like as the series went on, I became more like Katie. Fitt. Like my dress sense <laughs> became like when they first started putting me in leopard print, I was like, oh my God, does anybody wear leopard print? And then now leopard print, I lo I'm partial to leopard print nowadays. Like I really like a, le a pink leopard print. I'll go for leopard print. Um, and I think probably her like brutal honesty is is something that I very much relate to. Um, and and the fact that like the her she's very close with her sister. She wasn't very nice to her sister, but you know, like when it's like, yeah, but deep down there's a very close bond. Um, I relate to that. Gotcha. Well, my worth thing, Matt, let's go into a little bit with your sister. Catherine Prescott, who I know played in the movie A Dog's Journey. So how did your sister, Catherine, feel when you told her that you were on the autism spectrum? Oh, I don't know. You'd have to ask her. But she, I think, I mean, I think it was quite obvious to people that, I mean, she's the person I'm closest to. So I think it was quite obvious to her that I had autism. Um, but yeah, I mean, she was always accepting and never made me feel like it was anything to be ashamed of or to keep quiet or or anything. I think she, she was just like, right. And I think it has helped, sorry, it has helped our relationship because I think it helps people understand me a bit better when they know that I'm on the spectrum. Um, so I think it's, yeah, she's she's been great about it. That's wonderful. So I do want to know, so I know that again. So the goal of Skins show was to represent mental health. Do you think Skins did a good job representing mental health? I don't know if it was the goal to represent mental health, but it did cover some, I, oh God, it was so long ago. I haven't watched it in so long, but I do know that there was um, something with uh, Effie's character. Uh, she was struggling with her mental health. I think, I think some of the criticism that has come from it was that it it glamorized a lot of quite serious uh mental health issues which you know you could argue like it's an it's a TV show it's entertainment but I do think a lot of people watched the show and they were young and it was kind of the first time they saw something like that be discussed or be portrayed in like popular media so I do think maybe there were some parts which could have been a bit more carefully handled. But again, it has been so long since I watched it. I would have to rewatch to give my like proper opinion on that. Um, I think it was good that it was being discussed full stop because at the time, I don't think there was a lot of other things representing like, oh yes, young people do struggle with their mental health. Like, can we please talk about this? So I do think there's something to be said for the fact that it was one of the only shows at the time that was really genuinely talking about it. But I, yeah, I think you always have to be careful with how you present uh, mental health struggles, don't you? Because it's very easy to fall into like tropes and stereotypes. Yeah, and then it can also get real. One of the scenes in particular in Skins United Kingdom, I think, yeah, it did involve you. You were getting bullied by some blonde who was a cheerleader. You literally, I think it was in like a club or something. Oh! You gave him a punch and you basically oh, said, I I'm Katie effing Finch. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. So, I uh, guess. So, fun. That's like, um, like it's the my catch favorite scene. Uh, yeah. Oh, thank you. That's the catchphrase that everybody like remembers. But I think this, it's, I think I tried to repost it or something on, uh, TikTok and it was like you can't repost this because and then it's like uh, it contains violence and I was like oh I guess it does <laughs> so like I can't really repost that clip but yes that was yeah that was a clip about uh Katie being like taken advantage of and kind of it was I think that was her episode where you got to see kind of behind the curtain of her because she put on this like she was kind of a bit of a bully to her sister and Naomi. She was a bully. Um, and then you just got to see like, ah, this this girl, the reason she's like that is because of all these other things and what's going on at home and stuff. So I did like that it was like, hey, it's not it's not always what it looks like on the surface. Um, but yeah, that seemed that scene was fun to film. It shows why bullies are bullies. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, not saying that like, oh, it's okay to be like to bully someone, but it is interesting how cycles repeat themselves, you know? Oh, I agree. I did a full episode on blame for the listeners, C252 bullying, but it's a bullying cycle. When yeah. one person gets bullied, they're going to go for someone else because that's what they know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's really sad. So I know you said you had some symptoms of autism before, but what were some of the symptoms you did show? Clearly the outspokenness. I know that one. But um, the sensory feeling, but what else? Uh, so sound. Um, I mean, honestly, getting medicated for ADHD and finding noise-canceling headphones have changed my life like I didn't even realize how sensitive I was to sound until I got noise cancelling headphones and put like white noise on when I'm working and that is the only way I can get things done and I don't know how I was doing life before without noise cancelling headphones and it was it was getting me burnt out being in environments that were so loud and and like also uh, also, um, you know, watching TV or watching things without subtitles, I didn't realize how much effort I was putting in to try and listen to people talking. I wish people had subtitles, like, to be honest. Listen to people talking and hear TVs. And then I discovered subtitles and I was like, oh, my life got exponentially easier when I realized you could just put subtitles on. And I, th I think when I was younger as well, I would, they thought that there was something wrong with my hearing, which I've now learned is a common thing uh, with with autism because um, of your auditory processing uh, delay uh, that some people experience with autism. And yeah, I had all these tests done and they were like, "This her hearing's perfect. There's nothing wrong with her hearing. And I remember saying to them, it's not that I don't hear people. It's like, they say something to me and I think I don't hear it. So I say, oh, sorry, what? And then as they're saying it again, it's almost like, oh, I remember now what you said. So it it wasn't like I didn't hear it. I heard it. I just took longer to to process it. And that's like a number one auditory processing um, issue symptom. And nobody picked up on it. Um, so that was a big, a big symptom that I had all my life that was draining me until I realized there's actually things I can do about it um things like social things especially in the industry I was in like the acting industry relies so heavily on you being able to understand neurotypical social dynamics and I just like I was very well, I think I was very good at acting because I'm so used to pretending to be this person so I just got good at pretending but I just wasn't getting roles because I, I well I didn't know how to network and I, like when I'd go into auditions I just didn't know what they wanted me to say or do or how they wanted me to behave and it just it relies so heavily on that that yeah it just started to affect my career quite a lot That issue. Yeah, I hear you there 100%. So I know you said earlier that you were relieved and you felt validated with some of your diagnosis. Let me try again. With your diagnosis, you felt validated when you got the diagnosis. But was there another side you thought, I just wish it could have been sooner? Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. I, like, uh, well, I, I guess in some way I wish it was sooner. But then I think if I'd been told I was autistic 15 years ago or when I was, a ch or like 20 years ago when I was a child, oh God, more than 20 years ago, um, the world was not at a place then when it was accepted at all, really, for women to have autism. Or, I mean, you know, maybe in like people with very, very high support needs, they might acknowledge like, yes, this is autism, but it was it would have been impossible to get any it so it would have been just a whole other battle for me to get people to believe me even if I told them that I was diagnosed with autism I think at least now there is slightly more acceptance and understanding 
in like the general consensus that like oh women can have autism too and just because they know how to pretend to seem neurotypical it does not mean the same as being neurotypical like it it doesn't it is exhausting um but i do think often like what would have been di what would have been different like Maybe I wouldn't have been expelled. Maybe I wouldn't have been told off so much for talking back. But I, d I don't know if that was a thing you got, but I guess, because I take I take things really, really literally. So when someone asked me a question, I would just answer it logically and that I would get in trouble. And I just couldn't understand. And when, when I got told to do something in school, I would be like, why? And if they didn't give me a, a reason that I thought was logical, I wouldn't do it. And obviously there's a lot of rules in school that are stupid that are just to like get you used to following rules. But I got in so much trouble and I was like, I wonder if life would have been different. I would have been less, I would have been more self-confident if I had, you know, parents who understood, teachers that understood, friends that understood that I was autistic and therefore gave me some grace and so the support that I needed. But, you know, it's, I wouldn't have had the life I had if I had been diagnosed earlier so I can't like dwell on it too much but I am just very glad that nowadays it's getting slightly more acceptable to talk about women with autism yeah and there are a lot of stupid rules in school <laughs> case in point the bathroom yeah exactly that's, my, that's why I'm like oh I can just go a tangent on that one Stu like stupid rules like also, my dad, um, like, ever since I got diagnosed with ADHD and autism, he's had, like, a mini epiphany because, I mean, he's, he very, very obviously has both, too. <laughs> but, um, but so, he, but he was, like, a terror, got expelled from schools, like, so, but he raised me, so he always would say to me, you know, you don't need to do things when there's not a logical reason. And so he would like tell me his autistic advice, which to be honest, I'm very glad he did because it has served me quite well in like speaking out about things as an adult because I have my dad in my head being like, if something's not logical, point it out, don't do it. If they're not gonna give you a good reason to do something, say it. Like, <laughs> obviously you have to take it with a pinch of salt, but, but I do think having a dad that was autistic it's that thing where, you know, when you say to your family, I think I'm autistic and they go, no, that's normal. Everyone does that. And you're like, I think it's because you're all autistic too. So you think this is normal, but but this isn't neurotypical. <laughs> yeah, you ain't kidding there. I've had questions on some family members of mine, if they were or are. Yeah, I, yeah. I, but also I'm like, I love neurospicy people. Like the the best, the people I like most are on the spectrum but i just i feel sad for for generations like older than than mine that like don't get to be truly themselves because it's so unaccepted in society and they're just seen as these like people that just go against the grain just for the sake of it but it's like no maybe they're just they have they think differently i think i agree with you to a point i think it's because of the older generation in my opinion it might be their old school beliefs but I think it's also, they don't know how to take it. What, like take take being diagnosed? Take being diagnosed or take the stimming, flapping your arms. Yeah. Well, it's very much like, like my, like one of my grandmas is very, you know, that old school mentality of like, oh, don't be silly, like, Oh, therapy is is ridiculous. No one needs therapy. That's just that's just a joke. And it's like, and oh, no one had autism and ADHD. ADHD wasn't a thing in my day. Autism is like a new thing. And I'm like, no, they did. They all did. You just societally pressured them to like con try and conform, and a lot of them couldn't and suffered greatly as a result. Like. Or even when they say like, oh, nobody picked depression and anxiety that didn't exist 10 years, 20 years ago. And I'm like, it did. Just no one talked about it. And people were a lot more miserable about it. Like it, it always existed. And yeah, you're right. They just, some people just can't, 
can't deal with things that aren't like they've always been. And it's like, oh my God, get a grip. Like people think differently. Oh my God, such small town mentality. Like let's open our minds and not be so bloody boring. I agree with you on that one. It's like we said earlier. No. Yeah, it's like we said earlier, different did something. Yeah, yeah. They, what, now, there is a theory. Again, this is probably, this hasn't been proven, but I liked the idea um, that like, oh, actually it was it was ADHD, but like it, it, they, there was a theory that like a lot more Americans have are on the spectrum than British people, right? And one of the theories is that, well, back in the day before America was discovered, the type of people that would be like, hey, I'm bored. Do you want to get on a ship and go see if there's another land out there, even though we've got no guarantee and we might die? Yeah, I'll do that. That sounds fun. Yeah, let's shake it up. Probably had ADHD. <laughs> they were probably looking for change. So then they went, I mean, you know, horrific, colonized, whatever, but so they may have been the people who were more likely to have ADHD and be on the spectrum and like go explore. And I don't know. I just thought, I just thought that was like an interesting theory. Um, and we do need thinkers that are like, hang on a minute, stop. This is wrong. Like, and for so much of my life, I was, I had it drilled into me like, Hey, stop speaking back. Stop talking out of turn. Stop questioning things. Just do as you're told. And it's only since diagnosis where I'm like, actually, sometimes, uh, sometimes a lot of the time I'm wrong, but sometimes you lot are wrong. And you're so used to your little routine and the way it's always been that no one has the guts to be like, well, it's, it's always been crap. Like, <laughs> why don't we, change this like why is no one pointing this out and sometimes you need an autistic person to to do that yeah i agree i agree with you there so you yeah. talked about how your autism affects you today but i don't think i've heard much about how does your adhd affect you today i mean my adhd is uh quite uh i don't know if you quantify adhd but uh intense <laughs> um it's uh so it's it's knowing that i have adhd has made me be a bit nicer to myself so whereas before i would be in a social situation i would be interrupting and talking too much and whatever and i would go home and i would be like oh my god i am so unbearable why did i keep talking why did i interrupt why do i have any friends people must hate me i must be unbearable to be around and I'm still sometimes like god I really I needed to rein it in there but I'm not as like mean to myself about it because I'm like right but I my brain works differently so it's not like I'm just being an inconsiderate like person I don't know if I can swear on this on this podcast <laughs> um it's not like I'm being an inconsiderate person I just my brain works differently and the people that care about me will give me some grace with that I'm not saying it's an excuse to treat people however you want um but I do think looking back at all my report cards from school they would be they would say like she, if she could just sit still for a minute she would have uh she would have her work would be much better and Megan writes faster Megan can think faster than she can write and her handwriting is awful she needs to practice her her like her handwriting and just so many things when you look back you're like yes this little girl had ADHD so obviously and since uh taking medication uh I take non-stimulant medication because the stimulant medication was just a lot um but genuinely it's the only reason I've written two plays and I've like really gone ahead with my writing career is because I'm medicated my ADHD I'm medicated too because if I don't, I'm literally foaming at the mouth, and I'm like, I, uh, I, uh, yeah, I, when and and then when it starts because it's so the um, I'm on atomoxetine, uh, so it's non-stimulant and it's cumulative, so you know it wasn't like when I uh was on, was it Ritalin? Well, it works like almost immediately. It's like the same day, but uh, when the atomoxetine finally started working, I was like, oh my god. 
is this what you lot, can you lot just like think you're going to do something and just go do it? Like, is this what life is like without any, it's amazing. Like, it, honestly, there is there is a ADHD medication shortage in the UK right now um, because so many more people are talking about it and therefore so many people are realizing that they have ADHD and getting diagnosed that the National Health Service can't can't keep up with the amount of medication that's needed um, again because it's underfunded uh, which is really unfortunate. But I really, I really hope that people who get diagnosed have access to medication soon because it is so, it can be so life changing. It really can. I mean, it went from, in my difference, from C's, D's, F's to A's and B's. It really, yeah, it's life changing. I, um, I was re- listening to a book called about ADHD, and it was called, um, it's called Hunter in a Farmer's World, and it. It's so, I highly recommend it. Like it's such a great way to frame ADHD as not like the only reason it's a disadvantage in our current world is because the world has been set up for neurotypical people. But back in the day when we were hunters and gatherers, both neurotypical and neurodivergent people were valued equally. So like the ADHD people would be great hunters and like great lookouts because they notice things like they're really good at it, but they would be really rubbish farmers because they can't sit and plant seeds and wait patiently for them to grow they would get bored out of their minds and whatever but you need hunters and farmers to have a successful tribe but it's just nowadays society has just been been created or evolved into only for farmers only people that can sit at a desk or sit still for eight hours a day and if you can't you're the problem Whereas back in the day, we'd be just as valued as neurotypical people. So that's a good book to read if you need some validation. All right. Good good to know. And I forgot to mention, you don't have to hold back. I forgot to tell you that at the beginning. Okay, great. Okay. <laughs> I should have met. I know. I was like, please be outspoken. Okay, great. Yes. Okay, that's cool. great. So I know you were also, before you grown to the woman you are today, were interested in studying television production. So what got you interested in studying television production? So I was on TV sets from like the age of 15 because I I did my first TV job at 15 and then we did skins like when I was 16 to 17. So like a lot of time on set from very young. And I always found it way more interesting, like how the whole production comes together than just the acting part. Like I liked acting, but like the directing and the editing and I I just I loved and the writing obviously like I loved seeing how the first draft of the script I got changed as the as the drafts went on and what finally made it to tv in the editing room it was fascinating to me and I think it was because I always really want to tell stories that I've just always wanted to tell stories and I thought that acting was the best way to do that but then acting at a young age you're like oh actually it's not so much of getting to tell stories you're just kind of doing a lot of what other people tell you to do you're kind of telling stories but you don't get to decide what that story is you just have to do as you're told kind of um and when I looked at tv production I was like oh this is how you create a story like you create a narrative from like idea to like finished thing on tv and I started seeing how much potential there is for like social change in entertainment um and that again I was like I need to get into tv production because uh, like creating things that I want to make because that unfortunately it has more capacity to get social change than um, I think sometimes you know like documentaries as great as some of them are if you're not already interested in that subject you probably aren't going to watch a documentary about it however how many people who thought they weren't interested in meth production watched Breaking Bad and were like, oh, like sometimes people who have drug issues are real people and with real problems. And there's, I don't know, I just think, I just wanted to be in it. I wanted to have more control in an environment where I could impact social change through entertainment and production seemed like the way to do that. It reminds me a lot your reasoning just reminded me that your reasoning is exactly why I went into broadcasting and why I'm studying at college for it. 
don't get me wrong, there is some differences between television production and broadcasting, but they do a lot of intertwining as well. Both create stories, both still have its effects. Yeah. And and you have a voice. Like it's in, in broadcasting, I get like podcasting and stuff. That's why I started uh uh, produce like producing a podcast because I was like well in so many other industries you're kind of filtered and you have to say certain things and not say certain other things and or it has to be a perfect product like I think with tv as well it has to be perfect before it gets like on tv and I think podcasting was so appealing because I was like no one's expecting you to have a perfect thought out idea it's just a chat it's just a discussion and there's less pressure for it to be perfect and my therapist said to me one day when I was like struggling to write my play she was like listen perfection is the enemy of creativity like perfectionism is the enemy of creativity and if you and I was paralyzed with fear that what I was going to write or create would wouldn't be perfect so I just didn't write anything and that literally stopped me for years and it was really only when I got my ADHD and autism diagnosis where I was like, okay, just do a crap first draft and it will be crap. And everyone will be okay with it being crap because it's a first draft, but you're allowed to fail and you're allowed to like make mistakes. And that's how you eventually get to really good pieces of work. But I think with with podcasts, you have a lot more freedom to like slowly meander to the the point you're making rather than having to have it perfect already. Right. Now, what is your process for directing a film? I haven't directed a film yet, but um, I directed a TV. I directed some scenes for a TV series called The Burning Girls last summer, um, and it was just second unit directing. But it was, it, I got, I still got to direct actors, cars, and animals, which was very fun. Um, but normally, what I do is, so I listen to the the so the the show is based on a book. Uh, and so I listened to the book over and over and over again because I actually I love the book. Um, so I kind of learned what the original story was. And then I read the script over and over again. And then as I go through the script, I kind of I I highlight things that I think are important to get across, but that won't get across with just the lines, just the, just the, the words. Uh, and then I think of what the set's going to look like. So luckily this production had a great like pre-production art department team. So we got sent like loads of pictures and the lookbook for the show was beautifully done. And I was like, right, okay, this is exactly what they want. Um, they know the look and honestly, the locations were amazing. It was great. Um, so it was, it was quite easy in terms of that. They made it very easy, but I always storyboard. So like I see things, I think this is this is because I'm autistic, but seeing the final product in my head, I can just see it. Like I, if I read something on the page, I can see how I'm going to make it. And the only thing that I need to do professionally is prove to other people that I can see it because I want to be like, no, trust me, I can see it. Don't worry, I'll do it. But obviously that doesn't fly when there's a lot of money involved uh, in a production. They don't want to waste waste time. Uh, so I storyboard and I show them like roughly what shots I want out of what scenes. And I draw the location and then I draw where I want the camera and what angles I think we'll need to cover it all and any extra shots. And it, I love it all because I, I always loved art. And it's just creative, isn't it? It was, it's it's so much fun. Oh boy, I hate storyboarding. I had to do it for a, a class, and it's not that I don't like the concept of it. I get why when you do it, but here's why for me it sucks. One, I can't draw. I yeah that yeah that and must be two. The issue is with me, I need to talk it out. Like I can draw it out with the arm, like okay, here's this, here's this, here's this. But I'm like, no, let me just tell you about. It. So because I'm a very descriptive person. So I'm like, okay, I want the chair on the right. The yeah. lights go here. Yeah. I want it to be maybe where there's grass on the floor. Yeah. Clearly, maybe in Texas on a ranch, et yeah. cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I do know, I actually, a lot of directors I met hate storyboarding. So don't like, it's, it's not a necessity. And I've seen like the worst stick drawings of like uh, people trying to just show the shot. Um, but I, just, I think I just always liked art. So I, I actually get quite exhausted with 
trying to explain what's in my head to people. And I always prefer being able to type it out to myself or write like, and then refine it so that it makes more sense because the first rambling explanation of what I want in a shot won't make any sense to anyone except me, but then I can edit it down or draw a picture of it. And I'm almost better than like better at showing people things than I am at explaining. Cause I think with my ADHD, I just go off on tangents and I can't stick to the point and uh, it gets exhausting for both parties. Um, <laughs> so I do just prefer to show people rather than try and explain it to them. Yeah, that's strange. Cause we're all got to be opposites on that. Cause I can explain to something, to someone all day. Now, if it's with communication or conversations, it's a whole new story. Yeah. They're like, all right, here's the deal. This is my professional wrestling entrance. I'm envisioning yeah. this, 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 this. Get in the yeah. ring, do this crazy pose. Blah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. No, that makes sense too. It's interesting though, because it is, it's like we're both autistic, but it does, it does present differently. And so that's, I think that's another thing that people need to like understand. It's that just if you know one person with autism, it doesn't, it, by no means does it mean you know everyone and you understand everyone with autism because it's such a massive spectrum, isn't it? Yeah, Temple Grain said herself for listeners, C124, pictures from the ranch by Temple Grain. When you met one person on a spectrum, you met one person on a spectrum. Yeah, yeah. And it's damaging. Like when people, you know, this idea of like, oh, someone who's more or less autistic. It's like, no, you know, uh, Fern Brady wrote in her book, she was like, it's not a linear scale of more or less autism. It's a spectrum, but people just can't seem to comprehend that. Um, and so it's damaging if you think that if you know someone with, for example, like high support needs um, or who who is nonverbal, for you to then meet someone whose autism presents entirely differently on that spectrum, for you to be like, oh, they're not autistic because my cousin who's autism uh, can't speak. It's like, but okay, that doesn't, that it, that it's it's very strange that people have such, it's very strange that people think, think so black and white about autism, considering it's autistic people that are supposed to be thinking black and white. <laughs> Go figure, right? So yeah. you did say you did do directing work for the Burn Girls. How did you get that opportunity? Actually, it was um, through, so the, the director who did the, the, the first couple of episodes of The Burning Girls, he directed Skins, or he directed a bunch of, of episodes of Skins. Um, so I I said from back then, listen, I want to I wanna get into uh, media production. I tried to do a degree uh, at university, but it was so inaccessible. Obviously, I know now that I was having meltdowns and it was inaccessible, but at the time I just didn't have the words. I couldn't describe it. I was just like, this is overwhelming. I can't do it. I lasted two weeks and then I dropped out because I was like, this, I just, I can't do it. Um, so I spoke to the director and I was like, listen, university's not for me. I can't do it. Uh, can I just shadow you? Can I sit in on an edit? Can I like just watch you direct? And he was like, yeah, fine. Uh, and he came from a very working class background. So I think he understood the thing of how exclusionary it can be if you can't afford to go to film school, for example, which is very expensive. But he was like, you can learn on the job. You just need to utilize the people that you know. Um, so I stayed in contact with him since then. And yeah, he he just messaged me saying, hey, I've got some an opportunity to do some directing and some shadowing work if you want. And it's a great show. And yeah. It sounds really fun. Now you also did Holby City. How did that go down? Uh, Holby City uh, was acting, but that was uh, that was that was fun. When was Holby City? That was I get Holby City Casualty and Doctors mixed up. They're all medical dramas on in the UK. Um, but Holby, I I've, I always have really nice experiences on those types of dramas. Um, I recently did last year an episode of EastEnders, which I don't know. I don't know if they show it in the US anywhere because it's so uh, it's so British, <laughs> um, but it's like a soap. It's like a soap opera. And that was very fun. But it's a very different filming experience than, for example, Skins, because it's like a, it's the turnaround is so much faster on like soaps than it is on like a drama. But it's all really, really good experience, especially for directing to see how it's how differently it's done. You, 
you know what you, they should do then? Since you play doctors and have been in like horror doctors, they should have like the good doctor in United Kingdom. You yeah. play the doctor they on should. the spectrum because you are. They should. I mean, maybe I'll write it. <laughs> exactly. You're like, British ones better than American ones. Yeah. yeah. Prove prove that point. <laughs> exactly. Now, folks, we'll be right back here and ad from the Doug Flutie Jr. Autism Foundation. So let's get to it. At the Doug Flutie Autism Foundation in Massachusetts, people are receiving hope. The organization was established in 1998 by Doug Flutie, a former quarterback for Boston College and the NFL, and his wife, Lori, in the memory of their son, Dougie, who was diagnosed with autism at the age of three. The goal of the Flutie Foundation is to improve the quality of life for those with autism and their families. The biggest action they like to do is give grants and host their annual Stars on the Spectrum golf event. Our goal is to offer chances for physical and social activity outside of work or school, a path for education or employment during the day, and the resources needed to always feel safe, supported, and informed, the Doug Flutie Jr. Foundation says. Make sure to visit them on their website, www.flutiefoundation.org. That's www.flutiefoundation.org. Or follow them on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or even YouTube to see all the stars they have to offer. And you never know, you might be able to meet one of their stars if you are so kind and they allow you to do so. Finally, if this was a testimony, this would be my testimony for the Doug Jr. Autism Foundation. All right, folks, we're back. You might meet Doug Flutie there. You never know. So you also were talking about a podcast coming out, man, called Really Good Exposure. What mm -hmm. made you decide you wanted to start your Really Good Exposure podcast? Um, I think because... So... I, I've had had a lot of experience with. So I was I started stripping when acting was not making me enough money, and when working in a bar just became unbearable. Uh, and I wasn't I was earning minimum wage, so I started stripping. And so I've always had like I've always really felt the injustice that sex workers face obviously I'm very privileged so I'm I definitely was not experiencing the hardship that a lot of sex workers experience um but I just found the hypocrisies between how people treat actors and how people treat sex workers even though we're both pretending like we're both being paid to show our bodies sometimes like it's I just don't see such a huge moral difference as apparently the rest of society does and it's just work. It's just a form of work. It's just that sex workers don't get afforded the same basic rights as other other actors and workers do. Um, and I think my podcast, I have a lot of friends in the industry um, and in a lot of other random industries. And there are parallels with sex work in almost all other industries, especially acting. And that was, I guess, where the seed of really good exposure, the idea for it came. Um and I just wanted to talk to people like my friends and people that I know that have interesting stories to tell about their experience of working in their industry. And I think the idea was to kind of spot, I, I have a bunch of the same questions that I ask all of my guests. And I guess the, the point was to spot the parallels when in all work and why, you know, when we are living in a capitalist patriarchy, there are going to be issues for women in work. So I don't think it's fair that we penalize sex workers only because the, the problems they face are often problems that society has in general. We just love to make sex workers the scapegoats. So I just wanted it to be an exploration of like all different forms of work and how all different types of workers have issues. And we shouldn't just say to sex workers, oh, well, if you don't like your job, you should do something else. Because we wouldn't say that to an actor. If an actor had, when when the Me Too movement came around, there was no one talking about closing down the acting industry. But when anyone complains about their job as a sex worker or if anything bad happens to them during work, if they, you know, try and report it, they're often told, well, wh well, what do you expect? Look at the industry you're in. But in no other industry would we say that. We would say, oh, my God, we need to find the person that did that, expel them from the industry, make sure they're brought to justice and put things in place to make sure that things like this aren't able to happen again. But with sex work, it's just people don't care. And I, it's just an internally misogynistic thing, I think. And I wanted the podcast to explore that. Is that what stripped is? 
So Stripped was um, a collaboration I did with a theatre company called Sexquisite. And um, it was it was kind of like that because I played a character who was um, an actress and she'd run out of money. So it's semi based on me, but like a, a very heightened version. Um, she was an actress and she'd run out of money and she started working at a strip club. But she thought she was like so much better than all the other strippers because she was like oh no I why well, I'm not a lifer I'm not a lifer like this I'm just I'm just stripping just for the meantime just to like pay my rent and looked down her nose at all the other sex workers in the strip club um but eventually it came to a point where a producer made it very obvious to her that if she had sex with him she would be much more likely to get a part and she and she did it and the other sex workers were like huh so you judge us for for some of us for doing full service sex work and having sex for money but you also had transactional sex you just didn't get paid for it get paid for it in the end she didn't even get the job so it's like i just i, I sex work is very black and white version of what happens in society a lot anyway um I just think because often the women actually benefit from that financially, people don't like it because they don't like the idea of financially independent women. Um, I know I can agree with that because what I thought what it brought awareness to initially before I dig, dig, what I thought brought awareness to was my mother has this belief. And for a listener to see one of five meet my mother, but she has the belief that all, not all that it's definitely kind of a partial fart fault, but because the society teaches ladies that oh you should cover it up now you don't want the men to look there's i agree that to a point but there's also a response to the men to literally keep it in their pants yeah well it's this whole culture that we've grown up i mean for forever See, i don't hold back either <laughs> yeah with great i love it <laughs> but we we teach little girls that men's behavior is their responsibility so it is when you say to little girls like in school you your skirt needs to be below your knee because otherwise the boys are going to be distracted instead of that's teaching girls oh the men can't control themselves and so you have to adapt your behavior to allow for them not being able to control themselves that is not what we should be teaching little girls. We should be teaching little boys that it doesn't matter what the girl is wearing. You concentrate on your bloody work. Her, she's, it's not for, like, you control yourself. You're not an animal. It's very weird. But yeah, that runs through all of society. And this thing of, oh, a woman got attacked. Well, what was she wearing? Was she drunk? It's like, if I went out in the street naked, I still don't deserve to be attacked. Like, why is that? A justification but it's this horrible like like thing in society that we just think that men's behavior is women's responsibility all the time and it's disgusting yeah i agree with you on that one i think it, it needs to be taught though to both like, yes yeah like no no women, it absolutely you need to definitely keep it because i'm not saying boys can't control themselves i'm just saying it can be distracting not because for me personally it's not like oh my goodness really it's like it's not what we're supposed to do. Yeah, the, I mean, on the but at the same side, me teach boys don't look at it. Yeah. Well, when I'm saying we should teach both, I'm saying we should teach girls what you wear doesn't dictate your value or or how much respect you deserve, and we should teach boys you are not entitled to women's bodies, whether or not you can see all of it or whether you can see more of one girl's body than another. You are not entitled to anybody's body. So whatever she's wearing, you deal with your own shit. If you can't control yourself in front of women, you make sure you don't go around women. But it's unacceptable to say, well, she was wearing a low-cut top, so I couldn't help but assault her. It's just a very strange... No, you're 100% you're right there too. Yeah. You also end up as a bartender. So how'd you end up as a bartender? Um, that, so I, uh, I got a job in a bar like right after Skins because again, probably just thinking black and white, like I finished one job. So I was like, okay, well, I need to get another then. And everybody was like, 
no, but you're an actor. And I was like, right, but acting, I don't have any acting work right now. So I'll just get another job. Like I have to have income. What? Why is everyone struggling to understand why I would get a job in a bar? Um, and I actually, I actually didn't mind working in a bar. It was okay. It was exhausting. And sometimes, you know, and again, you get like harassed and spoken to like shit by customers and it's, you know, sometimes it was awful but sometimes I was like actually this feels like a standard job and I was I quite liked to have the comparison between the acting job which is very surreal especially at such a young age and this bar job because it was like oh okay this is what this is what like work is this is what hard work is and this is I mean acting is very hard as well but in a very different way and I'm just always curious. I just like seeing different types of lifestyle and different work and different experiences. So it it was, I was fine with it, but it, I mean, it, it was difficult at times, especially as a, a woman bartender, you get quite a lot of stuff, especially as someone who was on TV, because they would come in and be like, oh, what happened to you? What happened to your career? What are you doing here? And I just wouldn't understand it. I would be like, well, well, when I get another acting job, I'll quit, but for now i need i need income <laughs> that's why i'll be you're talking about you met getting harassed that's why i don't i've had like snips of, snippets of alcohol but not like two drinks or anything like that it's because i am terrified i'll become one of those let's call them harassers i am yeah, terrified i can't imagine i think if you're the type of person to do that there are clues when you're sober like it's just because what's it because alcohol just reduces your inhibitions doesn't it so if you're the type of person that would treat a woman like that deep down you can't have that much respect for women and I feel like you obviously do have respect for women so no matter how much alcohol you had you would never like it's like no matter how much alcohol you'd have you'd, you'd never like kick a puppy like because you just you that's not you don't you're not controlling yourself to not kick a puppy every day because you don't want to. So it's the same. Like if you went around every day wanting to harass and assault women, and then you had an alcoholic drink or two, then your inhibitions would be reduced. And then maybe you would, but that means that you were still a bad person when you were sober. And I don't think you have to worry about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's just to the outspokenness. Yeah. It's in the way. So if I'm like, Oh, so you're, drinking, you're well, it's like, and then, cause I say what's on my mind. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, you, and it's this derogatory terms that I couldn't live with because I'm like, yeah. I, I shouldn't have said that. But clearly yeah. I was under the influence and I didn't think clearly. Well, that's, it's good that you've, you've acknowledged that that happens if you drink. And so you're like, right. So the answer is, I, I don't can't. know. It's just a chance I don't want to take. Well, I think, well, then good. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. Oh, boy. <laughs> so you also are a bodybuilder, as we know. So what do you like about bodybuilding specifically? I loved, obviously, thinking back, I didn't know that this is why I loved it at the time, but I know now that I loved the routine of bodybuilding. Like the the routine and the schedule of like, I knew what my days would look like every day. I knew what I would eat every day. I knew how... I, I, it was just, I, there was a process and that you, it's like these things and you learn how your body works and what, what foods and what drinks and what supplements do what to your body. And it, I found it fascinating watching what your body was capable of with certain foods and certain types of exercise. And I just loved it. That's why I'm like very excited to, uh, be pregnant at one point because I'm just anything that your body it just amazes me what the body is capable of and bodybuilding was one of those things where I was like oh my god I didn't know my body could do this I never thought I'd be hearing that on a podcast episode you're excited to get pregnant never not bad I'm saying never thought I've heard that no I'm very excited it's just just it's insane that bodies can do that like it's crazy when you think about it no you're not 100% wrong but what about exercising? So what's your favorite exercise that helps you with your bodybuilding? Is it squats? Is it jumping jacks? Is it push-ups, sit-ups, or something else I'm missing? 
so when I was bodybuilding, it was it was a mix of so I would train six days a week, and then obviously that that's that's too much to train like for the average person. But I would train a body part, so like I would do resistance training on a body part, so like legs, and on one day, and then on the same day I would do some cardio. So but only low intensity cardio because you don't want to be doing high intensity cardio because it burns muscle um, when you're not eating enough or not eating enough carbs. Um, so I really liked doing leg days uh, because I, I just love leg workouts because I'm strongest in my legs and I like doing things I'm good at. And um, leg day was always my favorite day. And um, yeah, I, I really, really liked the resistance training. I did not like the cardio. I hated the cardio, even though most of the time it was just walking fast on an incline on treadmill, but it's just boring. It's so boring. I would have to watch something on my phone because I just, I just don't understand how people can do cardio watching nothing or just listening to music. It's too boring. There's not enough going on. Um, yeah, but it was, yeah, definitely the weight training was my favorite part. That's my problem with working out. So if I don't want to work out, it's I get bored easily due yeah. to the ADHD. So yeah. if I go in a gym, I can't do it there. Not because I hate the place. It's yeah. just whoop de do. I've seen it. Yeah. But going yeah. outside, oh. I can do it because I can change my environment. Yeah. I can walk from my mailbox. Then I can go work out in my field where I yeah. see the mailbox granted, but I also see my house. Yeah. Okay. I can manage that. I see dogs as well. Like if I know there's might be some dogs walking past, I'm like, okay, fun. I'll go work out there. Like even, even with them, I do a lot of high intensity interval training on YouTube. You know, YouTube have just videos of fitness, fitness instructors. And sometimes when I'm like, oh my God, I need to do some cardio because I haven't for ages, but I really can't be asked. I, I do like a 20 minute one on YouTube, but even that, I'll have that on one side of my laptop screen and then the other side I'll be watching like a YouTube podcast video. So I'm like watching, I'm doing the workout, but I'm also watching like a podcast stream because just the workout alone is too boring. I, I need to be watching something else at the same time because of the ADHD. Yeah. My, that's not enough though is the kicker. I wish it was. Mm. I tried before. I'm like, next. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. Yes. Well, so there's days when I'm like, no, I'm not doing it. I'm, I would be bored. I feel that one. So you also did a little more through bodybuilding by making a documentary called Dumbbells and Donuts. So can you tell us how you made your documentary, Dumbbells and Donuts? Well, unfortunately, it never got made. Uh, and then I did a whole episode of my podcast about why it never got made. I, so I won't get that into it now. But um, basically, the film crew that filmed it stole my footage and wouldn't give it back unless I paid them a lot of money. I offered to pay them some money, but I had no money. Um, and then they just stopped responding to me entirely. So it's it was very upsetting because I put so much work, not only into the bodybuilding competition, but into making that documentary so much work and so much money. And the competition, the federation that did it, very very rarely let film crews in and I managed to get hold of them and talk to them on the phone and get them to give me permission to have like a, a cameraman on stage with us and that just is unheard of um so it's really unfortunate that I won't get that footage but it was a it was a like a was it a life lesson to always make sure you have the right contracts in place, even if you think you can trust people, because sometimes when money gets involved, people just get very, very selfish and yeah, taught me to, to uh, always use proper contracts. Have you maybe try considering trying and take it to America? Has that, was that, is that an option? I don't physically have the footage. They won't give it to me. Like they oh, literally you can't won't... like go on YouTube and download it. Like oh no, that the stuff that's on YouTube. Yeah. But, they have hours and hours and hours of oh, footage. Oh, okay. Like, I see from the problem the now. Stage okay. Show it will be beautiful footage, but he, they just they won't they won't. No, respond. I get you now. Okay, it's that so makes more hundred percent sense. I was like, yeah. you sure you can't bring it here? It's on YouTube. Yeah, no, that stuff is is all mine. I changed my YouTube password. They can't take it down. It's mine. But yeah, sadly, I can't. I don't have the rest of the footage. But maybe one day. Yeah, but I did hear this. You were getting interviewed for the unaired show and you say that you're basically normally covered in food because yeah. you're clumsy so are you a klutz yeah yeah like and like getting food all over my face and I, I actually find it quite difficult to actually eat 
just the like cutting up things and stuff I have like really weak joints and stuff so I just get exhausted eating and the, the longer I'm eating the more mess I'm making because I'm just exhausted so yeah I'm, I am normally covered covered in food covered in food I feel you that one mine is I trip over my feet a lot oh do you yeah I'm quite clumsy I think yeah I'm quite clumsy so and something else no you are or did you makeup artists and that was one of your favorite things so why do you love doing makeup so I did I did makeup for a little while but um it went so it was mostly before I did bodybuilding um but and I actually and now I still do like special effects makeup and stuff for my uh my photo shoots sometimes um it's not something I do now and it's something that I was like oh wow this is like a full art and a full skill that people do like and I'm I was kind of just dipping my toe in um but it was it was probably just like a hyper fixation where I was like oh my god I love this I want to do this and then I was like nah not for me <laughs> feel that one yeah so so I know you do is art but why you say it was relaxing and perfect why do you find art relaxing and perfect? Um, I, so I need to do this. I need to get back into painting, but I, I did paint for a little while and I liked it because it was when I was too anxious to do anything, but also too anxious to sit still and do nothing. Painting was such a great way to ease myself. Like, cause I have a, I have issues with them. Um, task switching as well so just painting and like listening to a podcast or watching something on tv in the background like was my favorite thing to do it was really mindful and really grounding um I, I just yeah I need to get back into it I feel you on that one my grandfather for the listeners c122 meet big joe but he's a painter he does artwork as well it's pretty oh, wow. cool what he can paint for a while he did bubbles Oh wow! Like that must like, be really hard. Not like um, small bubbles that you know you, a child would draw, but they were big, fancy bubbles. Yeah! Wow! Wow! That must be difficult. Not when you not when you have his hands. Yeah. Unlike me, he's. I don't think he's not as fidgety. <laughs> yeah. Now, full we right back here an ad from Rock ninety six point one radio station. So let's get to it. We want to thank 96.1 The Query, especially David and Dan Hayes, for being a gold sponsor for our Summerfest. 96.1 residents in Bloomington, Indiana, and like Autism Rocks and Rolls, they rock and roll too. Visit their website at rock961fm.com to hear them out. And when they're on the station, be sure to listen to them live on their website or catch them on the radio in your car. If you like Kiss, Queen, 80s Rock, or ZZ Top, I think you have found your station. 96.1 also supports our adventurers, so you should support them too. Visit 96.1. All right, folks, we're back. You'll definitely rock out to this radio station. So, Megan, I, I do know you did an OnlyFans page. Is it still running? Yeah. Where can people find that page? Yeah, so I that's how I make most of my money. And it's the only reason I've been able to pursue writing and directing is because I don't have to spend all my time at a part-time job uh, or a full-time job making money to pay my rent. So it's been amazing. Um, it's I'm at Megatron on OnlyFans, M-E-G-A-R-T-R-O-N, same as on Instagram. Um, and yeah, it's there's a lot of comedy. There's a lot of me being myself, being very blunt, very open, um, but yeah, it's been, it's been surprisingly a fun and really fulfilling avenue for me. Just like your YouTube channel, right? Yeah. Yeah. YouTube was fun, but again, the only fans, I get paid for it. So it's like, great. It's like social media, but you get paid for it. It's great. <laughs> I bet it is. Now there is someone I know that seems like very important to you. That's not your sister, Catherine. It seems like your girl, Lily Loveless. Oh yeah. <laughs> so what has yeah. Lily Loveless done for you? So, well, we were in uh, Skins together when we were young. So she played Naomi. And so we've been friends since then. So it was like 12 years ago now. And then even before that, we randomly, we went to the same Saturday drama school, um, like in it, like in our local area. Um, so, yeah, it was so weird that of all the people to get the parts, it it was us and Lily because we knew each other before. Um but yeah, and then now we live together. 
so uh we've been living together for like two and a half years now um and yeah it yeah we've just been it was kind of like i guess skins was kind of like our version of university it's so neither of us actually went to university but it was like a bonding thing all right wonderful and we'll just wrap her up here and these are for fun so what is your paradise meal or favorite food and why is it your favorite okay I really like tuna steak, but like, or, or, or like sushi, raw fish. I'm just a big fan of. Um, it's my if sushi. I think is my favorite because it's. I like knowing that I'm getting all the nutrition. This is this is very uh, black and white thinking. Like I like that I'm getting like the protein from the fish. I'm getting carbs from the rice and then I'll have some like veg or salad on the side. And then I'm like, right, this is hitting all the right things. It tastes amazing. And I feel full and like satiated afterwards. Um, so my ideal meal would be like a large plate of sushi. Um, and then for dessert, I would have a cheesecake. Oh my God, cheesecake is my, it, oh, cheesecake. It's just the best thing. I and also on that one. Uh, yeah it has protein in it as well so so i'm like ah it's not all bad either <laughs> it's a little maybe it's got a little something special to it yeah I, what oh is your God. favorite movie or tv show and why do you like it uh i actually okay weirdly and i don't actually watch that many films because and i've realized it's because i don't my issues with task switching because i know the show will be over the film will be over in two hours like and either I've wasted two hours if it wasn't good, or if I liked it, it's finished. So I'm like, oh no! Like, so I always want to. I always watch way more TV series than I do um, films. But I watched a show called in a, in the US. It's called Raker, R E Y K A, and in the UK, it's called The Canefield Killings. And it was about a woman detective, uh, a, um, sorry, psychological profiler in South Africa. And it was so good. Like the writing and the direct, the directing was beautiful. And it was directed by this really young South African director. Um, and it just, it was just amazing. I loved that they, they had local crew, local cast and crew. So it was like creating jobs instead of just always shooting everything in America or the UK. Um, oh, it was just, honestly, I highly recommend it. It was brilliant. All right. I'll definitely check that out. So what is it your favorite vacation I've ever taken? Why did you enjoy that vacation very much? I haven't taken a vacation since like 2019. Uh, where have I been? Oh, we had... Well, I, in two, well, I think it might be the one in 2019 because we, uh, my friend, um, Kaya, who was also in Skins, she played the lead she um she took us all to mauritius uh because she had like a a company who had like private villas in mauritius and they were like listen do you want to do you want to like promote this and we'll give you and your friends a free stay and we were like absolutely um so we got this beautiful villa in mauritius with a butler and like it was like a life i was I was like, what, who am I? I have a butler. What is this? It was amazing. It was, ah, uh, it was beautiful. It was amazing. Well, I'm going to be having a private chef maybe when I go to Texas for a retreat and this will be a first one for me. <gasps> oh, I've, oh, that's amazing. I'm jealous. I know. Sorry. <laughs> Not really. No, I'm kidding. I, I feel bad. If I could share green beans with you, I would. Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. So my final question is, are there any good memories they want to tell our viewers about? If you do, why do you remember that memory the most? So before you answer, I want you to end with a good memory that was sentimental, that will stick with you. You just thought life is good. And a funny memory that made you fall on the floor laughing. I'm so bad. My like recall is terrible. So I'm going to try. So, so you want an uplifting one and you want a funny one. In in what sense, like from acting or from anything you uh, want, acting, just... doing this, um, with your sister, your client, you want to answer it. Um. Okay. This is just like a, 
It's just a weird thing that ha- lots of strange things happened to me. Um, <laughs> um, but one time I was nannying uh, in LA when I lived there, and I went to go pick up this. So what the girl, the little girl I was nannying, she was like, "Oh, we need to pick up my friend from her house, and then go shopping." So I went to pick up this kid from the house and like, it's LA. So a lot of these parents had like massive houses and like, so it was not that shocking to go pick up kids with massive houses and whatever. But this house was particularly like fancy. And I came in and no parents were home, just the, just the kid. And, um, and then, and their nanny. Um, And I was looking around this house and I was like, what do their parents do? Like, this is an amazing house. Like, what is what is going on here? And then as we were about to leave, um, I was saying goodbye to their nanny. And then the dad came in the door. And I was like, and he had sunglasses on. And I was like, I recognize this guy, but I don't know why. Maybe it's because he had a British accent. So I was like, oh, it must be just because he's British. I'm just not used to hearing British accents because it's all American. And then he took his sunglasses off and it was, um... <laughs> oh my God, I'm going to forget his name. It was Batman. What's his name? The actor? Well, there's a lot of Batman actors. I don't know. The uh, the Dark Knight. Wait. Heath Ledger? No. Well, maybe. Hang on. I'm just Googling. Batman. <laughs> oh, my God. People listening are going to be screaming. Christian Bale. There we go. Uh, people listening are going to be screaming at me that I'm an idiot. It was Christian Bale. Uh, and um, yeah, he was really nice. But I was like, this is so random. I'm looking after Christian Bale's child and in his house. <laughs> no, the funny screen I mean for thinking was Heath Ledger because I realized, wait a minute, Heath Ledger ain't British. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I didn't even realize that. Um, and Maybe then we'll I both think... get screamed at. <laughs> yeah. Um, then I, I guess an uplifting one. I think, well, I guess something happened. Well, the other night I went I went to a Christmas party and I dressed as Santa. And um, one of our friends was just saying to me like, oh, you, you're so, like what you post about and what you say and what you stand for and the things that you, you talk about and the things that you want to do in the world is I just want to wrap you up and, and give you a cuddle. You're just such a, a light in the world. And I was like, oh my God. Now he had had a couple of drinks. <laughs> But I was like, it was like one of the nicest things anyone has ever said to me. And I was like, ah, a lot of what he's saying about like things that I talk about and stand up for are directly because of my autism, which, you know, five years, even three years ago, I would have been like, oh God, I'm such a loud mouth. I'm so annoying. I just ran on about these topics. But actually, this is like one of the first times where I was like, oh, someone is actually giving me a very nice compliment and it's based on things that I do because of my autism and that's really nice because that doesn't happen very often so that was a nice memory well good at least you got that and did you get that cuddle yeah I always get cuddled to me he was dressed as so I was standing and he was dressed as Mrs. Claus so he was sitting on my knee for most of the night fair <laughs> enough well Megan thank you for your time is there any closing remarks you'd like to say or tell our listeners before we head out of here um I just think you know if you are, if you if you have been diagnosed with autism, autism that's amazing, and I hope you have the resources and you have the tribe and you feel supported. If you, there, I know there's a lot of people that feel almost too guilty to to think they're autistic. They're like, oh well, I'm not autistic enough to warrant telling people or pursuing a diagnosis. And I just think that even though you know, people told me when I was pursuing a diagnosis they were like well what's the point there's no medication like ADHD you can actually get medication but what's the point of getting paying for a diagnosis or trying to get a diagnosis for autism when there isn't actually anything you can do and that's utter bollocks because knowing that you actually have autism is such a validating thing and you can start to almost grieve all the experiences you've had which you will have had if you were undiagnosed autistic and you're like you know in your 30s 20s whatever like you start to grieve all the experiences where you were treated poorly or you you felt badly because you you couldn't deal with a situation because you were autistic and you were living in a neurotypical world and you were just expected to do all these things that you aren't your brain isn't isn't naturally wired to do um so i really i would 
pursue a diagnosis if you can. Obviously, that's extreme, an extremely privileged thing for me to say. But even if you can't get a formal diagnosis, I would say look into it and don't feel too guilty to be like, oh, well, I know someone who has more support needs than me who's autistic. Therefore, I can't be autistic because it is such a vast spectrum that even like the experts still don't fully understand. Um, so I think understanding yourself is the, the key to living happier so please even if you can't get an official diagnosis don't be scared to consider yourself as autistic because it is it is not anything to be ashamed of and the more you know about yourself the better and now in the year 2023 it isn't anymore and i agree with you thank you again megan have a wonderful day you too thanks for having me